Counsel. May it please the Court. My name is Robert Jimenez. Good morning, Your Honors. I represent the appellant, Sandra Castillo, in the instant appeal. At this time, I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. To begin with, I actually was hoping to take a step back for a moment to make a general comment. No doubt there's been thousands of foreclosure cases on appeal in the state and across the country, but not one, not one has presented the issues in the context of Florida standing law. And I think that's where we should begin today. Of Florida what law? Florida standing law. There have been thousands of cases, but none of them have raised the issues in this context, this particular context. The first issue, plainly, is, as Your Honor saw in the brief, whether a defendant borrower can challenge the plaintiff's trust standing by pointing to violations of the trust document. And from what Your Honor saw in the brief back and forth, there's really a lot of argument about two cases in particular, Shell Development Court v. Kirk and Martin Properties, Inc. v. Florida Industrial Investments. Now, your client's not a party to that trust agreement. No, Your Honor. Not a beneficiary of the trust agreement. No, Your Honor. And, you know, your client is somebody who hasn't paid their mortgage, correct? My client has not paid the real party in interest, which the record shows is not this affidavit. Now, the original promissory note and mortgage, were they ever handed over? At the summary session hearing. So your client hasn't paid? The original mortgage has been what? What? I have to ask the question that Judge Shepard asked before. What are we doing here today? Quite a lot, Your Honor. And actually, I'll premise it this way. Forty hours ago, I received a notice of supplemental authority from the appellee. And what that said was that there was a case in the Middle District of Florida that was just handed down a couple weeks ago, and it brought up that very point. It said what they wanted to say, which is that the borrower doesn't have a right to challenge these trust documents because they're not a third-party beneficiary of it or a party to it. That's the privy-based standard. The issue, though, is Florida law has absolutely rejected that for four decades. Florida law on what standing is to challenge is premised in those two cases. And what's your best case? Mark Property Inc. And what does that case say? In that case, there's the absolutely analogous situation. There, Martin Crock, well, I'll just point the facts a little bit. One party, Florida Industrial, had assigned, it was an assignment of a right of redemption to another party. NPI wanted to challenge it, and it was the absolutely same argument. If you're not a third-party beneficiary, you're not a party there, too, you have no standing to challenge. The Fourth District Court, holding based on the previous case from 1971, Judge Development, so it spans, at that point, 30 years, at this point, 40, they rejected that outright, saying that is not the test. That is not what standing to us is here in Florida. Standing is based upon having a sufficient interest in the outcome of the litigation, not privity. Privity has been absolutely rejected as the standard of standing in the state for over 40 years. And so, as when it comes to court, without a court. So, in other words, if there was some violation of this trust agreement, notwithstanding the point that the individual who actually foreclosed this mortgage had the original document in his hand, and your client has it paid, which means absolutely that your client is going to be foreclosed and collected again, that there is some harm to your client as a consequence of something that happened between some other people somewhere else out there in the ether. Tell me precisely what it is out there in that ether between those people to which you are not privy that actually gives your client one grain of sand of harm or right. Precisely. And I think you're asking, I'm going to answer precisely, as you asked me to. I think what you're really asking is, what is my client's sufficient interest in the outcome of litigation? No. What is your client's really interest in what happened with these other people? Since your client's interest in this litigation is over, you've been foreclosed. Your client didn't pay at all, and the original documents by the person who was due the money have been submitted. So now tell me how what happened up there has any effect on what has already happened here. Well, I would disagree that the party that has the right has garnered that judgment. But what happened was they violated their trust documents and sued my client, alleging that my client owes them and their trust a debt. We proved, as a matter of law, that their client does not owe any money because their trust is not on the instrument. Now, the instruments were turned over, were they not? 
So are. that is no longer up for grabs. So other than that, what do you have? So the issue is that because they don't own the instruments and because we're talking about a trust, they the very have the great. documents. They have, isn't that between them to duke out? Your, your client is what held harmless at this point. There's, there's nobody else to come get your client on this note mortgage. We don't know that, Your Honor. That's not in the record. Um, I have no idea if there is another party that is going to allege that they own it, but nonetheless, my client has been sued by the original, the original that note and mortgage are in a court file. They are, Your Honor. But there's there's nothing there's nobody else. else. Nobody else, because the law in this state is that in order to foreclose, you must produce the original documents. They are there. They are in the court file. Your client is completely protected. Well, I, I think there's something else about what the law says in the state of, about that. Um, there isn't anything else. The original has been put in. If we if you had to reestablish a note and a mortgage, then the person who is reestablishing them would have to come in and basically agree to indemnify or to hold harmless the individual saying, if someone else comes forward now and says, stay on it and not me, then I'm going to, I'll be responsible. But this is not even a reestablishing case. The originals were put in. They're there. And it's over. It doesn't matter who else wants to say they own this. As far as your client's concerned, it's over. It, it seems that your entire argument is that you were never put on notice of the chain of ownership, does it matter who owned it between the time, uh, the two times? I mean, there is no endorsement other than when it's produced and the original is produced. So when the, the, the bank has the original and says, okay, now this is the original and it's not been endorsed by anyone else and we're in possession of it, do you care who may have had possession of it in between or who may have had ownership of it in between? It doesn't matter anymore. Well, to respond, Your Honor, I think it does matter respectfully because Florida law tells us that it does. There's a variety of cases cited in my brief from cases actually that the other side cited, like Johns versus Jillian. But there are a um, number of federal cases out there that, that say you simply don't have standing um, to assert any legal rights if, if you're not, you know, you're not a part of it. I, I absolutely concede that those federal cases say that, which is why I already spoke of the cases that were given to me recently. But the problem with those cases, and actually I'll talk about the, the Canella case, which is one of those, the one from the University of Florida. Those federal cases fail to apply our law. Florida law on this issue of the, the right and the standing to challenge is fundamentally now, different. Do you have reason. a single Florida case that says when an original promissory note and mortgage are filed in the court, foreclosing a mortgage, that, that the person who's being foreclosed has any standing at all to question anything that happened up the chain of title. I do not have that case, Your Honor, because no and prior counsel, case... And counsel... If I may make the point, Your Honor, the reason I don't have that case is because no prior Florida case has contemplated these issues in, these, in this context. That's why. We're the first ones to raise it. The, the, the litany of cases from federal courts and some other cases that the Apple cites aren't going to say that, previous cases aren't going to say it either because it's just never been raised before. Counsel, but, we, we've left you away over the time, but we will give you a minute for rebuttal. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Diana Mastin, representing Deutsche Bank. Um, I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. You don't get a rebuttal, counsel. You just give it to us straight for the next ten minutes. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you feel you must. Um, I would just like to add that um, based on the supplemental authority um, that we supplied the court a couple of days ago, this is new law. It's new law everywhere in the country. In, in 2010, when, when this defense was first raised, we filed a reply to the, to, to the defense asserting that they're not a party and they're not a third-party beneficiary. We had no case law at that time. It didn't exist. But since about June of 2011, these, these cases started to emerge out of the federal courts. And those are some, I chose four of these cases to give the court um, a sampling. Um, but I'd like to, the court to pay particular attention to the Walker and the Edwards case. Um, that was at Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, I believe, where they have a similar law, law similar to Florida in that they use the UCC. And those two cases in particular resolve both issues that were presented on appeal here. Number one, that, that the defendant, the borrower, doesn't have standing to, to assert any violation of the PSA regarding the, the standing, the assignments, or the endorsements, or the lack thereof of anything. Um, but what Walker and Edwards also um, resolve is the second issue, which is that 
the defendant's position is that New York trust law um, controls the situation, and these two cases say that, no, if you're a UCC state, the UCC controls, and that's what you're okay, only saying. Okay, if I was a person know. holding this error note Correct. and had it, then I would be a happy person because I would just be foreclosed. That's right. Whether you were entitled to it or not, you hold, you hold it. So the Walker and the Edwards case give a very nice summary of the UCC, the application, and the interplay between the UCC and the New York trust law. So I would urge the court, um, if you're going to issue an opinion on, on the matter, because this, this type of defense is so prevalent right now, and, that's, and it hasn't reached the appellate level in, in our state, but it has in, in a lot of other states. Um, and I think it would be very, very helpful for all the, uh, the people engaged in, in foreclosure to have a decision um, similar to Walker and Edwards that will walk um, the attorneys and the judges through what the thought process is um, and adopt, I would urge this court to adopt the reasoning and the holdings in those cases. Thank you, Counsel. Counsel, we'll give you two more minutes. Thank you, and may I please the court once more. Um, with regard to the UCC, again, uh, the text of the UCC itself and the decisions interpreting the UCC do not contemplate the existence of an external factor that would prevent enforcement of the instrument. That's never been argued before, and that was why, in my brief, I rely heavily on these cases that tell us what standing is. I concede that those federal cases say what it says. They adopt the privity standards. And the that would be a problem between Joyce Bank and everybody up the line from you because in this state, with that Dara bond and the Dara note and everything, and you're 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 out now. You're finished. Your your client, although they lost their property, is done with these folks. There's not going to be any take back for your client. There might be some argument between Deutsche Bank and everybody else in this chain, but they're stuck with it, not your client. Well, from from the interpretation that I had of the Martin Properties case, it's it's. From that, that I gather that I, I think the opposite position is, is actually what, what the court should employ here. The, the, without question, the privity standard is the way the appellee wins this case. Th- that's it. And in the law for 40 years, our state has rejected that. Your Honors have absolutely every right to, to, to conflict with the fourth and second districts on this point. Um, but with regard to the UCC and with regard to what the law and precedent has been, they're asking this court to effectively rewrite standing law so that they can foreclose on an instrument that as a matter of law we prove by the Congress of evidence that they do not own. There is a litany of cases that also stands for the proposition that we have the ability to challenge ownership of the instrument. And if I may give you one quote, it's from a case that they cite, actually, and, and I'll conclude with that, Your Honor. I'll conclude with that. The, the quote is, a person seeking to enforce an instrument conveying an interest in real property must demonstrate he has directly or indirectly acquired ownership of the instrument. The majority errs and I'm insisting upon this fundamental precept. Uh, there was the chef that he said that in mind, the case of Day went ahead and, and, and cited to. I couldn't agree more. And I think when you look at that concept in the broader picture of other cases like Chilean, like your construction that we cited to heavily, you see that we can challenge ownership. And we can do it because Florida law tells us that we have, we have a sufficient interest in our litigation. And that is the standard in our state, not privy. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.